Hello, I'm Noah, and welcome to Flipside Episode 2. Thanks to everybody who checked out my last episode and shared their thoughts and opinions. In Episode 1, I relied a lot on nostalgia and an already established love for some of my favorite artists. That's why with Episode 2, I wanted to try something different. Instead of picking an album I was already so familiar with, I wanted to further my background on one I listened to many times before but always wanted to know more about. In my research, I discovered that not only does knowing the fuel behind the Ring of Fire make it more hot, but it sears into your brain, branding it, leaving its mark on you forever. The mixture of emotions that come with this album struck me harder and harder the more I listened. Its dark shroud overwhelmed my attraction to other music as everything else seemed to lack that same incarcerated beast of an audience that is echoed through generations. And of course, the raging country album I'm referring to is Who is Johnny Cash? You know, that guy tattooed to Post Malone's arm. Well, even if you aren't familiar with him, I'm sure you've at least listened to one of his songs without even knowing it. I'll start with a brief background introduction, because like most popular artists, their life is just as interesting as their work. Born in Kingsland, Arkansas in 1932, Cash was the middle of three older and three younger siblings, his mother wanting to name him John and his father preferring Ray, eventually settling on the initials J.R. for a first name. Coming off the back of the Great Depression, Cash's family was experiencing financial hardship like most back then. Spending his younger years picking cotton and singing hymns with his family, life was tough for this destined artist. Specifically after the death of his older brother Jack, which gave Johnny long-lasting guilt, feeling he had some sort of responsibility in the accident. Later enlisting in the Air Force, he served overseas in Landsberg, West Germany as a Morse code operator, deciphering messages from beats and taps before writing his own. After being honorably discharged, he and his first wife Vivian moved to Memphis, where his career eventually caught on through Sun Records. Having the chance to play with other up-and-coming legends such as Elvis Presley and Jerry Lee Lewis, who also started under the same label. Well, the sanity in the world is three that heartbreak hotel. You'll be so long. Drinking heavily and consuming a fair amount of amphetamines, Cash was still able to deliver in the studio and on stage, but burned plenty of bridges along the way. One of those bridges literally burning several hundred acres of land. This fiasco was on a fishing trip with his nephew in 1965. Cash's camper caught fire and nearly took his own life. In court, he claimed it started from a faulty exhaust, but his nephew suspected Cash started the fire to get warm and lost control of it in his drug-fueled state. When the judge asked why he started the fire, Cash replied, I didn't do it, my truck did, and it's dead, so you can't question it. Although it'd be funny to imagine what the reactions were in the courtroom that day, try to put yourself in the shoes of one of Johnny's friends, family members, or bandmates. How hard it would be to stick by someone with such disregard for his own life, especially with fame and money backing his corner. Johnny seemed to reflect on the sorrows a life of fame can bring in his later works where he did gritty covers of tracks that were personal to him, a bittersweet send-off to his monumental career. If you want to know more about Cash's career, I'd highly recommend James Mangold's Walk the Line. It's a wonderful biopic, giving us a deeper look into Johnny's later drug addictions, which had a huge impact on his career and his loved ones. At the start of Johnny Cash's addiction recovery in 1968, in large help to June Carter and her family, he needed to come back big. His career had taken a hit, and the ever-changing music industry was pivoting more towards pop stars, ready to leave him behind. This drove him to rekindle an idea that had been shot down by management many times in the past, producing an album from a live performance at Folsom State Prison in California. Back when Cash was in the Air Force, he watched a screening of Inside the Walls of Folsom Prison. This is partly what led to his fascination with the outlaw lifestyle. After watching the movie myself in preparation for this episode, I can see one key element from the story that continuously influenced Cash's career. 
redemption. The theme of the film is to try and reshape the public's perception of criminals, recognizing them as people even after the crime. In a tense scene from the movie, David Bryan's character, Mark Benson, confronts the warden of Folsom Prison, played by Ted DeCorsia, after he let a prisoner die by working in dangerous conditions. Mark claims, In your twisted mind, a convicted man is no longer human. He's a thing to be kicked around, to be thrown away. This seemed to be a common perception of criminals from that era, and may be a line that rang close to home for Cash. He may never have been convicted to long-term prison, but he was convicted by himself, tortured in his own indulgence through numbing the pain through alcohol, drugs, and sin. Not all, but a large portion of Johnny's music and personal outlook seem to reflect a sort of sadness or guilt. A lot of his lyrics, whether he's singing through his own eyes or someone else's, have a weight to them a burden that is expressed through admission or personal acceptance for a committed crime. I'm sure that is one of the major internal steps Johnny had to take to move past his addictions. Another being his rediscovery in faith, something that had faded through his fame and fortune but never went away. Having a close relationship with a minister that worked at Folsom Prison was another main reason that led to the big idea of recording a live show there. Performing at prisons in the past, this was no new concept for Johnny, except actually producing an album from it. Building that outlaw persona, he had become very popular with America's incarcerated community, some prisoners even mailing him lyrics and songs in hopes that he would be able to turn them into his next big hit. Luckily, there had been a change in management at Columbia Records since his last pitch, and the project was greenlit. On January 10th, 1968, Johnny Cash, June Carter, The Tennessee Three, and Cash's openers, Carl Perkins and the Statler Brothers, arrived in Sacramento. Graced with two days of rehearsal, the California governor of the time, Ronald Reagan, even visited and wished them luck on their shows. And while rehearsals went on, another group of performers had been prepping for these shows their entire lives. The inmates of Folsom Prison were some of the worst to ever live. Being one of the first ever maximum security prisons, it helmed over 1,200 prisoners, all living out long-term sentences for murder, robbery, kidnapping, you name it. It's safe to say that if they were there, you probably did never want them getting out. And some didn't. If they hadn't died from internal complications, the prison was the first in the world to have electricity generated from a hydroelectric powerhouse, resulting in over 93 condemned prisoner executions. Folsom being known for its harsh conditions, prisoners spent most of their time in the dark, behind solid boilerplate doors in cells measuring 4 by 8 foot, due to overcapacity sometimes storing up to 4 people in one cell. Taking into account California's fluctuating desert weather in the summer and winter, having experienced it myself, it's safe to say those cells were very unpleasant. It's easy to think that these men may have deserved this for whatever they may have done, but taking a lesson from the film, it's important to keep in mind that self-absolution is always on the line, even when spending the rest of your life behind bars. Now, I know what you're thinking. Why the hell would anybody want to perform for a bunch of dangerous, low-life prisoners? Well, look at it this way. Imagine a poorly kept dog locked in a cage for days without any food or water. Now, imagine that same dog let loose from the cage and presented with a raw steak and a full bowl of drinking water. You catch my drift? Cash expected this to be a great show and the perfect way to revitalize his career, but I'm sure he had his worries nonetheless. Now let's talk about the actual vinyl. My first impressions of the cover image, shot by Jim Marshall, was concerning. The photos of Cash, me and I'm sure everyone else is used to, were usually simple. Him posed with his guitar on stage, smiling or singing, like most albums of that era. Nothing special, just something to catch your eye. This one includes similar features, but there's something different. It's close up, grimy, no polish to the moment. 
an overall unflattering look for Cash, with the folds in his chin and sweat beating down his face. What stands out most to me is the darkness in his eyes. It might be a stretch, but when I see this look, it feels like we caught someone in the act of wrongdoing. A man's expression, brightened by a police officer's flashlight, seconds before he's putting them in handcuffs. A feeling all of the audience members had experienced, being that they are the heart and soul of this album, there couldn't be a better photo for the cover. On the back of the album is a set list and a very detailed handwritten introduction from Cash himself, sharing his experience with his short time behind bars and what exactly it can do to someone. The introduction reads, The culture of a thousand years is shattered with the clanging of the cell doors behind you. Life outside, behind you, immediately becomes unreal. You begin to not care that it exists, all you have with you in the cell is your bare animal instincts. My particular vinyl is a little bit weathered, but still has the shimmer of a polished shoe. Looking up the matrix number, I was able to discover that it is an original pressing from 1968. Who knows, this could have been purchased the very day it was released. Whenever I listen to it, I like to imagine the previous owners singing and dancing to the songs. Another one of the many reasons why I love vinyl records. For example, I picked up a Cream album for a couple bucks the other day. Not for the condition, but more for the music. To my surprise, I find this doodle left on the paper sleeve of some giant finger pointing at a monster truck. What's the significance? I don't know, but it gave me a good laugh, and I imagine whoever drew it was rocking out to Eric Clapton just as I was when I found their drawing. I bought my copy of At Folsom Prison when I was visiting Arizona, after not being able to find it at any record stores in my local area of Washington. I had searched for months, but I couldn't find it behind the hundreds of Nirvana records. After visiting a fun little record store in Mesa, Arizona, Uncle Aldo's Attic, they had this prominently displayed above all of Cash's other work. I had then realized what a regional difference record stores could have. Washington's grunge rock had snuffed out all of Johnny Cash's country records, while Arizona had more than they knew what to do with. That's why I make it a point to check out record stores whenever I'm visiting new locations. You never know what you're going to find. Back to the main reason I bought this album, the music. I listened to Johnny Cash before, but mostly his slow tunes. They were classic, of course, but definitely not something I listened to on the regular. Then, after watching Walk the Line, I decided to check out more of his music. That's when I came across this live album. January 13th, 1963. Johnny Cash and the Tennessee Three stepped on stage to entertain men whose daily enjoyment came from remembering what it was like outside of prison. The band aimed to help them by bringing the brief freedom of a concert back into their lives. They were set to play two shows that day, picking the best tracks from both performances to put on the album. Cash, dressed in his normal all-black attire, sat in front of a sea of blue uniforms, ready to start a riot. Holy shit, was I blown away when I first listened. Feeling as if I was in the crowd, my perspective on this old country star turned on a dime. Out the gate, Johnny Cash opens up with his signature Folsom Prison Blues at Folsom Prison, which, if you're familiar with the original, this sounds like a completely different tune, transitioning from old-timey country to rock and f***ing roll. Backed, of course, by the hoops and hollers of convicted men, the band's instruments chug along like the very same train depicted in the song, and Cash effortlessly controls the crowd like a rabid dog held from a leash. All prison-themed tunes, the performance transitions from one song to the next, with fun banter from Cash and the inmates in between. Their communication is reminiscent of a group of old buddies meeting up for the first time in years. After the track Dark is a Dungeon, Johnny mentions that because the performance is being recorded, there's no cussing allowed. This show is being recorded for an album. You can't say hell or, or anything like that. Cocaine Blues also receives a wild reception, describing a man who is on the run after killing his wife. Slower songs do appear on the album, but are warranted by the quality of the performance and their relation to the audience. In the track, The Long Black Veil, after singing the lyrics, I've been in the arms of my best friend's wife, Cash receives this reaction. 
best friend's wife. <laughs> Did I hear somebody applaud? <laughs> After finishing that song, he goes on to make fun of the terrible condition of the drinking water at Folsom Prison. You know, I have a drink of water. Last time I was here, I had a drink of water. And I uh, must have run off of Luther's boots or something. You promise that's water, huh? Is that water, Bob? <coughs> that's water. Without spoiling the rest, there's fun to be had around every track. Eventually, Johnny brings up June Carter for a duet on the track, Jackson, which is sometimes overshadowed by the cheering of men who probably wish they were in Johnny's shoes on stage singing that song with such a pretty gal. The show coming to a close, Johnny lays the cherry on top by playing a song written by an inmate at Folsom Prison, Glenn Shirley. He was sitting in the front row completely surprised. Gene Beely, a reporter for Ventura Star Free Press, one of the only non-inmates with the privilege to see the show, reaccounts the event. He jumped out of his chair, Beely recalls. I thought his eyes were going to bolt out of his head. I don't think I've ever seen a happier man alive. Cash heard a recording of Shirley playing his song the night before the shows, only rehearsing it a few times before playing it on stage. Coming back to the theme of redemption, the chorus sings, Inside the walls of prison, my body may be, but my Lord has set my soul free. The song ends, but the track continues recording as the men are dismissed back to their daily concealment. Please hold your seats until released by the officer and then go out through the side door. The sound of chatter returns to the granite halls as if the concert never happened. And we are left with an extra 30 seconds of clattering metal, echoed footsteps, and voices lost in time. Then, abruptly cutting to a faded silence. A haunting end to such a riveting performance, leaving you wondering why it wasn't cut sooner. Perhaps a message from Cash asking us to remember these men after they've passed, for they had already been forgotten when they lived. When released, the album was a success, ultimately revitalizing Cash's career. Those shows played at Folsom Prison are still widely known as some of the best performances ever recorded. There were some complications with the first live single released from the album, Folsom Prison Blues, when the radio station stopped playing it due to the lyrics, I shot a man in Reno just to watch him die. This was because of the recent assassination of Robert F. Kennedy on June 5th, 1968. And a few years after that, somebody shot his little brother too, only he was in a hotel kitchen. Must be hard being brothers. With great protest from Cash after remixing and re-releasing the single, it eventually drove the album to a familiar spot for Cash. Number one on the Top Country Albums chart. At the time, Columbia Records invested little in promoting this album, still falling in line with the newer pop stars. That had no effect in the end though, because no matter how thick the bars or how tall the walls, Cash and the inmates of Folsom Prison reminded everybody that they still existed. Following up the success of this live album, Cash went on to record another next year, this time live at San Quentin Prison in California which ended up being Cash's first ever album to hit number one on the pop music charts. From being certified triple platinum to being added to the National Recording Registry, At Folsom Prison is still ranked as one of the best albums of all time. I highly recommend everybody listens to this album at least once so that you can experience the power of one of the best crowds to ever exist. I promise you'll feel like you're right there with them maybe even reminiscing about some of your own bad deeds from the past. Though, no matter how big or small, Cash's music will wash away your sins, and perhaps enlighten new ones, but also reminding you, it's never too late to change. I would like to end on another handwritten quote from the back cover of At Folsom Prison. Listen closely to this album, and you'll hear in the background the clanging of doors, the shrill of the whistle, the shout of men, even laughter from men who have forgotten how to laugh. But mostly, you'll feel the electricity and hear the single pulsation of 2,000 heartbeats in men 
who have had their hearts torn out, as well as their minds, their nervous systems, and their souls. Hear the sounds of men, the convicts, all brothers of mine, with Folsom Prison Blues. Johnny Cash. Thanks for watching. If you've made it this far into the video, I genuinely appreciate your time. I want to apologize for the gap of time between the last episode. I love producing these videos, but they can sometimes be hard to make when my own artistic desires are fueled by the very artists I'm writing about. Eventually, I would like to be on the other side of one of these videos, but until then, if you could throw a like or a subscription my way, that would be great. Also, if you know someone else who might have similar interests in a video like this, if you could please share it with them, I'd really appreciate it. If you missed my last episode where I dove into my love for the Rackin' Tours and their gorgeous vinyl, you can find that linked below. Thanks again for watching, and I'll catch you on the flip.